we do webinars, but today we have an excellent film premiere from a very special guest, Lucy Martins. Now, just to be clear, it's, it's not a, a very long documentary. It's about 15, 20 minutes. So you want to be present for it. So make sure to close those tabs. I know you might have a bunch open, so close them down. You want to be present. You want to be focused. Uh, because there's, there's it's a beautiful message in this film. I've watched it. I thought it was excellent. And if you like the work of Rajendra and water cycle restoration, this is a great film all about that. So I'm going to let Zach introduce Lucy and Lucy introduce the film and we'll take it away. Awesome. Yeah, it's a really, uh, this is just a really beautiful uh, piece of cinema that Lucy's created here about, I think, one of the best projects when it comes to water and peace. Uh, we can, you know, people who really dive into the water topic really understand how interwoven with peace it is. But for a lot of people, they don't understand. And this is a real excellent example where bringing water back to a region created peace in that region as a result. Um, and so Lucy, I met at the UN Water Conference uh, in New York City, and she's created this really beautiful film by traveling to India and seeing the results of these projects, um, some of the same areas where I visited a number of years ago. And it's just breathtaking the, the difference that's been created in the quality of life of people living there. Um, so when I saw this film, it just blew me away. And I immediately asked Lucy, hey, can we get you on for a film premiere? And she was nice enough to agree. Um, so Lucy, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, showing this film tonight. It's the first kind of public online screening. And um, yeah, so I met Rajendra one and a half years ago at COP26, 27 that was in Egypt. And um, we were part of a, a similar group. And he invited me to India to show his water projects. And when I went a month later, I was pretty blown away by the water movement in India just all the grassroots movement and and the passion for water and and um yeah what Rajendra really was able to change and create with his team so he then said can we make a film for the UN for last year's water day so I came to India and I that's where I met Zach and I made a short little film um only spent like a few days in India and then I created a small film and then I went back because we really wanted to dive deeper deeper into the bandit story um, because it's um, fascinating to see water from all these different levels, not just what it, what it does as creating livelihood. It really is also about creating peace and inner peace. And I was very much interested in, in looking at the bandits and what kind of transformation it, it did for them and how water is also a healer from the inside, not only from the outside, obviously. So that was kind of my ambition. And obviously there was challenges, so we didn't get so deep into the bandits as I had hoped for because you know trying to find them in a place where there's not much electricity or internet that um yeah we just kind of uh shot what we got and um it was so beautiful to to spend time in the villages and and I think I was also a little bit of like Rajendra's um showcase of you know a western woman coming to this place that most Indian people are very scared to go to because of um because of its connotation with violence and bandits. And now when you go there, you just, you feel so safe and you feel so much um, hospitality and love and care by the people. So um, yeah, so you can watch the film and we can talk about it more afterwards if you have more questions. Awesome, beautiful intro. And with that, we'll uh, get right into the film. And folks, if you have questions during the film, feel free to enter them into the question and answer. Um, that's the best spot. And then when we get to the end, we'll dive into a little bit of discussion around the film uh, and also answer all of those uh, questions that come in. So without further ado, the world premiere of Water Bandits. Water is a great healer. 
water is the nourish to the human kind and to whole nature the healing of water always creating the peace हाँ हाँ ठीक है अब तो आई जाएंगे हम ट्वेंटी ईयर बिफोर वी स्टार्ट द वर्क इन दिस रिवर क्योंकि यहाँ पानी नहीं था काम नहीं था खेती नहीं थी ये जो उजड़ा हुआ विरान क्षेत्र है वो हरे भरे खेतों में बदल गया बीच में नदी भी बहती हुई दिख रही है You know these all community is a indigenous people called Gujars. These people have lot of love to the land. They have great love to fauna and flora and water. This water is not for us only. This tree have the right on water. this grass has the right on water this river has the right to water so every life have the right and responsibility aaj se 10 varsh pehle ye jo paadi dikh rahi hai biran paadi thi nangi paadi thi aur jo hi badal ki boond aati thi वो सीधी पहाड़ियों पर पड़ती थी बीच में रोकने का कोई माध्यम नहीं था तो जहाँ बादल की बूंद इस पहाड़ी पर पड़ती यहाँ सूखा हो जाता था बिल्कुल कोई फसल नहीं होती थी लोगों के सामने पानी का बहुत बड़ा संकट था तो इधर गांव सूखे से बेहाल हो जाते थे उधर बाढ़ से गांवों में बहुत भारी नुकसान होता था पहले जमाने में इस पूरे कैचमेंट एरिया में इस तालाब के जो बारिश की बूंद पड़ती थी ना जैसे अभी आपको मैं दिखाऊं पानी के साथ मिट्टी भी जा रही है ना पानी अमृत और मिट्टी सोना जब गांव का सोना और अमृत बह गया तो फिर गांव में जवान छोरों को क्या मिलेगा भाई इफ द वॉटर इज हियर सो एवरी वन दे आर लिविंग विद लव एंड रेस्पेक्ट ईच अदर नो वाटर कॉन्फ्लिक्ट कम इन दाइफ the conflict come in the life of human kind and the conflict with nature also in the part of dholpur region village called mathara this village and this dholpur region is very famous for the bandit of indian culture हमारे पास पानी नहीं है हमारी जमीन में भी पानी नहीं है अगर जमीन के अंदर पानी होता तो बोर कराते कुछ बातें पैदावार ही करते जब हमारे पास पैदा नहीं है तो फिर हम क्या करेंगे इफ नो वाटर नो लाइफ इफ समवन नॉट गेट द लाइफ सो ही कैन फाइट फॉर लाइफ लाइक बैंडिड लाइफ सो द फाइट फॉर लाइफ इज ऑलवेज वायलेंट जय इलाके में डकैत बनो करेंगे पैसा लाएंगे आप जाएंगे किसी से छीनेंगे कुछ न कुछ पेट का गुजारा तो करेंगे जो पैसा नहीं था तो हम भी ऐसे ही धंधा करते जाते कहीं रूट पार थी को कुछ भी तो इस कदर से हमारे लिए कुछ डर था हेलो ना मैं ना कर ही करेंगे मैं जब फरार है वो तो चार आदमी में बिगाड़े हूँ ऐसा <laughs> हो तो क्यों बेसा हरे वाये थे भैया भाई रास्ता पकड़ती हुई और चलो वो भाई के संग ही चलेगी फिर अब जंगल में निकल गए थ्री नोट बंदूक है तीन चार राइफल है बढ़िया लेस केस लगे जाते हैं नब्बे नब्बे केस लगे अमन थे अपन को डर रहता है कोई हवाई सूचना नहीं दे दे प्रशासन आ जाए आठ साल अपराधी जीवन बिताए जंगल में 
तो ये इलाका पूरा डरा हुआ था भयभीत था क्योंकि अब पानी नहीं था खेती नहीं थी और सरकार ने इस इलाके को अपराधी क्षेत्र घोषित कर दिया था हम तो खाली पैसे के लिए ऐसा कोई वो नहीं है क्योंकि पैसे की कम थी पुराने गाँव में दस गाँव के बीच एक कू पैसे वाला वाला थोड़ी पूंजी है जो तो पाने को सहारो बना लो जब पानी नहीं है तो पैदावार क्या कर सकते हैं फाइव ईयर बिफोर इन दिस विलेज स्टार्ट द वर्क इन कंजर्वेशन बिकॉज वी आर वर्किंग मोर देन फोर्टी ईयर इन अलवर डिस्ट्रिक्ट एंड थर्टी एट ईयर इन सवाई माधोपुर एंड करौली डिस्ट्रिक्ट एंड द ऑल वर्क नॉट द आउटसाइड ऑफ द इंजीनियरिंग एंड टेक्नोलॉजी द ऑल इंजीनियरिंग एंड टेक्नोलॉजी इज लोकल द ऑल वर्क बाई इंडिजिनस नॉलेज सिस्टम एंड दिस पीपल सी दिस वर्क तो ये तरुण भारत संस्था वाले काम करौली क्षेत्र में हो पहले तो जब हम देखा थे आगे तो जो इन थी हमने मुलात खात करी क्या है हमारे क्षेत्र में काम है बढ़ाऊ तो हमने उन्होंने उसे देखा कि भैंचु पानी की सुविधा है बढ़िया खा तो हम भी लोगों से मिले एंड दे इन्वाइट अस सो आई स्टार्ट द वर्क क्रिएशन ऑफ पोर्ट A process is very simple. First, we see the site, the catchment area, the ponding area, and where we can create the small pond in a concave design. Or where is the gentle slope? We make a simple straight design. The catchment area where the rain water coming in a way. So the pond. collect the water of rains and that water going to the underground aquifer and when the recharge the aquifer the water come on surface now you can see the water if no rains the underground aquifer full so water level come and that water using for life for livelihood and dignity पूरी है गई बरसात आने बरसात फुल भरी गई बातें हमारे मतलब सरसों गेहूँ इन्होंने मिले तो इन्होंने किया कि भाई तुम गलत कामों को छोड़ो पानी की सुविधा हम करेंगे तुम पानी की सुविधा करेंगे जब हमारे लिए जो खाने के लिए नाज हो जाएगा पीने के लिए पानी हो जाएगा फसलों भी बढ़िया होंगी तो हम भैंस भी रख सकते हैं तो उन्होंने कहा कि इनका बेनिफिक्सर जो कुछ होता है जो यहीं देते लेते हैं इन्हें तो ये पैसा लेते हैं उन कुछ करते हैं तो चलो भाई हमें हम भी लगा देंगे द कम्युनिटी ड्रिवन डिसेंट्रलाइज वाटर मैनेजमेंट सो द ऑल वर्क डन बाय द कम्युनिटी विदाउट एनी सपोर्ट ऑफ गवर्नमेंट नॉट ए वन A small structure created by any government. इतनो बदलाव है कि मतलब ये पानी को सारो है वो तो यार को सारो नहीं हो अपनों मन मान जाते हैं फिर ग्रस्ती को बजन पड़ जाते हैं बच्चन में लगाव बन जाते हैं तो वो रास्ता फिर धीरे-धीरे छूट जाते हैं अब बढ़िया सुखी जीवन जी रहे हैं this indigenous knowledge system is not a like modern education 
the modern education always teaching us extraction of nature and creating a pollution in nature and encroachment on nature when the people see the visual impact they believe they realize they internalize and they get the confidence अब क्या है कि जो पानी हो गया तो जमीन से खाने कमाने लग गए तो फिर हम गलत काम क्यों करें हम सबसे बात फ्री है तो अपने इस पूरे कर्म को छोड़ दिया हमें अपने पा अंदर से कि भाई ये तो बुरे काम है फिर भले आदमी नहीं यहाँ बैठते हैं तो फिर सुधार हुआ थे सो बिफोर दिस विलेज इज ए वायलेंट नाउ आई कैन से completely non violent place without dignity no happiness without livelihood no happiness and without life we can't imagine the happiness so these come with water we have the sufficient water on this planet but we are not conserving we are not giving the respect to the water so this is a uh, situation now all over the world this world facing disaster of drought and flood and people is displaced and where they are going so that people say they are the climatic refugee so they created stress and tension अब हम खुद पानीदार हो गए तो हमें इससे ये प्रेरित तो होता है कि हम खुद पानीदार हो गए पड़ोस में दूसरा क्षेत्र दूसरा गांव है हम उनमें भी जाकर उनको लोगों को जागरूक कर रहे हैं हम खुद अपने मालिक हैं हमें किसी दूसरे के नीचे नहीं जाना पड़ता मजदूरी करने के लिए आप भी नहीं जाएंगे आप क्राइम की तरफ जाते थे हम भी जाते थे पहले तो हमें वो क्राइम भी छोड़ दिया हम उस रास्ता पर आ गए आप भी उसी रास्ता पर आ जाओ so now they are creating the awareness and the creating the confidence and the creating the love so this is the process of the healing of water so it is a healing of water and this healing is a peace and prosperity and this peace and prosperity not coming without love not coming without confidence not without trust this way is now the peaceful the water say i am for everyone i am not for business i am for every life fauna and flora i am water i am for this whole planet we are not divided by the boundary of nation i am one of this planet and this planet is also one so we are one
Awesome. So beautiful. I'm just blown Excellent. away every time I watch it. Yeah, super beautiful. Great job, Lucy. That was fantastic. Thank you. My comment streaming in. Amazing. Hand claps. Beautifully done. Great. So Lucy, do you have some anything you want to share about the film before we dive into question and answer? Um, no, I guess I shared a little bit already beforehand. So, um, yeah, no, questions will be great. We can go right in there. I'll say for me, I really love the way that you build on the the emotional nature and just how how integral water is to peace without stating it explicitly. This implicit understanding throughout the film that I think you've done a beautiful, beautiful job of of integrating and uh, making people feel that without having to say it, which is always just a, a mark of truly remarkable cinema. So folks, feel free to answer, put your questions in the question and answer or raise your hand if you want to ask uh, with your voice. I think we have uh, but Judith, Judith Green. wants to talk. So Judith, I'm going to go ahead and for some reason I can't unmute, but maybe Zach, if you could do that. There we go. Hey, uh, Judith. Judith. You'll need to unmute yourself as well. Figure that out. Um, well, if if Judith gets her microphone working, we'll get back to her. But is any? Let's go to some questions. Yeah, we've got a bunch of questions coming in the chat here. Um, is the basis of building the water structures based on the ancient Indian practice of Vastu, or do you want? I don't. I haven't heard Vastu before. Are you familiar with that, Lucy? No, me neither. It is and maybe very... yeah, Russ could explain. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Russ, if you can I mean, explain... well, I understood it's it's based on indigenous wisdom, as you know, Zach too. Zach probably knows a lot more, but um Rajendra did learn it from an elder in the village, how they used to do water, rainwater harvesting in the past. So it is based on an ancient Indian practice. And I would say probably ancient indigenous practice all over because it's replicable all over the world to use this kind of method. Um, do you want to explain more, Zach? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely is a it definitely is an indigenous practice of the area that became much less common with colonization and with the bringing of piped water and new water systems. I think in a lot of places, certainly in India, and then you also see this in the American West. They had very intricate system for distributing seasonal flood waters throughout landscape, particularly in the desert Southwest, uh, that you know, in ways that formed the basis for uh, flood irrigation for a lot of the West. But we've also, um, I think we've applied the techniques without applying the relation. And that's caused some issues that, you know, sometimes we even have similar practices, but just in a much more extractive manner. Uh, and this is one of the things that goes hand in hand in these communities. It's also growing water-wise crops in the seasonal cycles that make sense for natural agriculture, not just creating an infinite amount of water to use, however, in an extractive manner, but saving water and also conserving water. Yeah, so here's been a bit more explanation what Vastu is, that it's an ancient system of architecture based on the direction of wind, sunlight and other natural elements. So the way I understood that these water, these structures are also built close to certain trees or um but anyway but it's definitely completely without technology and it's all based on on nature and looking at certain places where those structures could work well um but again zach is more the specialist in that than me oh that's a great way i mean i think it is very much based in relationship to water and land and orientation um I've never heard that term explicitly used, but it sounds very much in line. And Rajendra is always talking about how it's all five elements coming together to create life and uh, to create nature. And so I, I think it is very in line with it, even if it's not explicitly. And I would imagine 
it had an impact on traditional practices, which is what this is entirely based out of. Um, so I imagine a lot of overlap there, even if not absolutely direct. Yeah, no, and reviving rivers, a big message was like, you know, water conservation and soil conservation are one and the same. You can't, you know, if, if you're capturing water, but paving and tilling and brutalizing the soil, the water is not going to go in, it's not going to infiltrate, and you're going to need that to create the greenery. So it's it's like these things are not mutually exclusive. A question here from Jim, uh, and feel free to raise your hand to folks if you want to ask questions with your hands, or sorry, with your voice. Um, long term with glaciers disappearing, will water still continue to come down from the mountains? Um, yeah, I don't know how, do you mean, I don't know how that's related to India, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the rainwater the water above the glaciers is more affecting the, the sea levels and through that also the water cycles are changing and through that the rain and the temperatures are changing um but in terms of india i guess yeah i mean because they've got glaciers that will go into the ganga the ganges river um i don't know what do you think zach like i'm sorry i'm not that best so good in technical questions of water i'm more like on the film experience side yeah and to me, this these techniques become even more important with the loss of glaciers. You see, there's actually a huge portion of the world that's dependent on that steady stream of water for their water supply. Uh, and so as we lose that, it becomes more and more important to store the seasonal monsoon waters. And so in this case of these projects, I don't know that they're actually dependent on glacial runoff at all. Um, I think they would have, have not yet lost the year round nature of their rivers, um, but they're more focused on the seasonal monsoons. When those seasonal monsoons come, hold all of that, charge that in the landscape. The same practice applies though, if you're looking at a bigger with glaciers high on the landscape, you still want to feed that water slowly and store as much of it on its way down. Um, I think a, a big thing that we've taken as a misstep in our relationship to water is prioritizing downstream flow when in fact we need water to touch as many places on its downhill path as possible. Uh, and so as we lose this steady supply of the glaciers, we need to recreate some kind of steady supply in a functioning earthen sponge that can help balance out those extremes uh, of seasonal moisture availability. I, I like these two questions, one's from Josh and others from Sarah, uh, filmmaking questions. So Josh is asking, Lucy, what was the biggest lesson that you gained from making this film? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I didn't know much about water. And um, when I met Rajendra, I thought he was like such a force of nature and so inspiring. And, you know, he's very captivating and it's hard to say no to him. And I thought like, wow, he's just so driven and he's he just flows like water. And this might be an awkward answer, but I kind of wanted to make a film about water just to also learn how to flow like water. <laughs> so I thought I'm going to take this film and um, and use it as an experiment and just kind of go with the flow and and see, you know, not plan too much and just go with Rajendra's kind of energy and, and follow him and just trust. So. And then also understanding that water is just so, so important and such a key um, element and um, and just wanting to learn more about water. And yeah, and I think also I very much believe in grassroots level, uh, grassroots movements. And I'm also very much believe that places like India and Africa and all kinds of indigenous wisdom is so important right now to merge that with yeah, with the modern world or, or the modern wisdom. So I really, yeah, support any kind of mes message that's to do with supporting the voices of indigenous wisdom. So I think that was also a huge incentive, yeah. Cool, so Sarah's, Sarah's asking, she's saying, really wonderful film, thank you. What was the, what was the time frame of impact? I.e., how long was it between building first ponds and the commuting the community actually seeing peace in the villages. 
Now, I know that's probably a hard question to answer, but did Regender give any sort of hint as to when they built the ponds, how how long did it take to really transfer it, transform from a this bandit plagued area back into one that's a bit more peaceful? Um, so Ivan said that he started working 40 years in that region and specifically in that village. It's one of the newer projects. So it's been like 10 years and they there's also a river close by called the Shoney River that's now, you know, flowing and gigantic and, and healthy. And so there's a whole community around there as well. And, and these villages are connected to the river because through the recharging of these ponds and the aquifer, it also started recharging the river. So there are a lot of different communities that are connected that have benefited from this work. Um, and I think in that, so that village was the last 10 years, but the whole area, the last 40 years. And um, yeah, and then also with like, um, there was also some kind of like peace building being done with the government as well on the side with, with some of the bandits. But, um, but people still find it's like very, very, uh, they wouldn't go there because then when they hear Chambo district, it's got like such a such a name that you would like, oh my God, I would never go there. It's too dangerous. And so I think it's it's really the main a big message of the film, I think, is that human beings are inherently actually really good people. But if you don't have security, if you don't have food, if you don't have livelihood, then you know, people become bad people, criminal people. And I think that was also a big incentive for this film to a really kind of yeah bring more understanding why people turn violent mm -hmm. it's a huge message it's so important in the world right now and you just see you know the incidents of water driven conflict becoming more and more common while we also have these amazing examples that when you think in 10 years they essentially went from violence to peace now that was part of a 40-year project so you can't kind of pull it apart they are related but how incredible that in one decade you can have that kind of transformation um, is breathtaking in a way uh one question uh from barbara here um i'd love to be in direct contact with lucy how do i do that uh, i just put lucy's instagram in uh, the chats here i'll drop it in here again as well um that's a good way to follow uh and she has a a website that'll be uh, redone that's at the end of that film. And I'm also going to share the film link with you guys all here in the chat. Let's get this film to have in front of as many eyeballs as possible. Um, we're going to share it in the community right after this event. And please share it with anyone that you know uh, that could benefit from this message. Oh, yeah, sure. Far and you're also wide. welcome to share my email if you want. I mean, I'm happy to give that. If people don't have, don't use Instagram, I can just type it in here. Yeah, well, that'd, be, so. that'd be awesome. A lot of people are asking for your email. Um, so here's a follow-up question about that. For Lucy from Karen Bradshaw, she's asking, Lucy, how will you bring the learnings from water and community lessons and apply it back home in your own life and your community? Will there be another film following water restoration? Good job. Um, yeah, good question. I am um, for the past year, I've actually joined a water group that um also just to understand more the importance of water. And I think that Regendra's work is, you know, is totally universal, uh, universal, as Zach is doing similar work in the US and and we have friends who are doing um the same amount of the same structure building in the Sinai Desert um, in Egypt. You can take it to Australia, to 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 Africa, whatever. And I am um, and also looking back home, so I'm in Europe and also there's been like extremely hot summers and the underground aquifers are also drying out in certain places. And um so I've just been thinking like how important this knowledge is to actually bring to Europe as well, because drought and floods are something that are interconnected and are happening all over the world. So um, I grew up in Germany and there have been, you know, there was a huge flood um, a few years ago and um, and there's been drought now. And so I think, and, you know, Regendra's late, the message at the end is, is for me also very, very important that water has no boundaries and that I believe <clears throat> 
that we really have to like or that we can really learn from the natural elements because we are in our human conditioning so about separation and borders and boundaries and and how can you water also be a unifying force for all people to really come together in this like kind of climate degradation that we're actually um facing and i think more and more people need to wake up so um this i think this message is for everyone yeah especially because as a filmmaker i'm always about building bridges and how can one also change kind of the idea that people have of of Indian people in the village where they think, oh, these poor people or they're uneducated and, uh, you know, and they've got so much wisdom. They've got so much light in their eyes and um, and we've got so much to, light, to learn from, from people um, like in India or Africa or all over who are just still really connected to, to nature. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, kind of a good follow up question. Um, and maybe more of a rhetorical question, but perhaps elders would know what the landscape used to look like before the fauna was lost or water flow stopped. This is a really important concept that, you know, we have this shifting baseline as humans that whatever the average over the last five years was, we assume that's the way it always was. Uh, and I, if you ask elders in the different areas what their landscape used to be like, your heart will just break. I mean, I've been at community dialogues where when you start getting the 60, 70 and 80 year old people sharing about what their region used to be like, you know, you're hearing crystal clear rivers and springs and water throughout the year and food falling on the ground everywhere. And this is in areas that now have extreme water scarcity. And people think that's the way that it's always been. Um, and I, I think this really ties into what you were speaking to, too, Lucy, of elevating these traditional techniques, these indigenous voices, these local community people that, you know, we can look at it from a Western world perspective and think, oh, they live in isolation and we know so much more, but we're destroying our landscape and making the rivers yeah. die while they're bringing their rivers back to life. And so clearly there's something for us to learn there. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to, you know, how you experienced that in India and yeah, with your absolutely. other projects as well. Mm. Yeah. So what I understood is that, um, because of the mining and the deforestation, that's how the soil then became dry and, and unhealthy. So when the rainwater come came, then these floods would be created and, and it wouldn't go into the underground aquifers anymore. So, um, you know, and mining and deforestation is also part of creating or being part of like the system that we have created in, in the world right now that obviously I'm benefiting, benefiting from. So, um, yeah, I think... It's like looking at how we've changed the landscape and how we need to kind of look at the whole system as a holistic functioning or dysfunctioning system, which it is right now. And as Zach said too, that, you know, sometimes building dams or like creating kind of modern technology can like really interrupt the natural flow and that can create um, havoc in I like I actually what I've learned also from elders because I've worked with a lot with indigenous elders around the world like looking at the earth as a as a human or as a body in itself you know if you we start like blocking our arteries or kind of like taking our blood or taking a bone that we were just like some point start collapsing and that's what's happening with the earth right now too that we really have to start seeing that that the earth is just like a living body like we are and that we are nature we are not separate and we have completely lost that that mindset and and that's something when I was in India I just I felt so happy in the village because the food you eat is just it's very very simple and very basic but I felt actually taking in more nutrition than I would you know when I'm in the city and then the water we drank it out of the well it just you know, it's something you would never think you would do in India, but it felt uh, very nutritious water and um, sleeping outside right next to the cows. And then they just pick up the cow dung and and use it for fertilization. And everything is like so interconnected and the lives there. And I I felt my whole nervous system was just like really, yeah, calming. 
And um, that was actually also why I just so loved going back to the village <laughs> to film because it was a bit like a holiday. So, yeah. I see, and everyone's uh, just so lovely and friendly. It's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, so nice. Imagine. Yeah. So there's a good question from Eliza, but I, I selfishly wanted to ask one for myself. This is actually for Lucy and Zach. Now, I'm sure being there was almost like this pilgrimage and getting to see the effects of these ponds and water bodies. Did Regendra ever take you to areas where they, they kind of lack ponds and lack water? Did you ever get to see the contrast in areas around, you know, around Rajasthan that lack these spaces and what they were like in comparison to these villages that had water and water, you know, water capture structures? Did you, Zach, did he take you to some places? I mean, I would say everywhere we drove through, except for the few <laughs> example projects fit that bill. Um, it's you kind of are just driving through this dusty desert where you're imagining how could people possibly live here? And then you get to these oases where there is water and where there is life and where there is a village. And so we didn't go into the, any of the villages before they had water, um, but you see just the immense difference in everywhere that you're driving before and then once you get it really reminded me of seeing some of seps projects in the extremadura in spain where you're just driving through a desert and you reach this oasis of life and all of a sudden there's birds and wildlife and green vegetation and for me it was very similar to the experience in india where you know we're driving hours and hours and not seeing any sign of life other than some withering bushes. Um, and then you get to these areas that are agriculturally productive, ecologically alive uh, and have water. And that was, yeah, kind of the big just aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also what was interesting when I was there in the summer in Delhi, there was a huge flood as well. And Rajendra was actually on TV a lot at that time because again that's so interconnected with everything else that's happening in India <clears throat> and then he was interviewed a lot like why is there a flood now how come the river flooded and um, it's because of like certain dams that were being built and because the water doesn't have its natural flow and and um, I think that that was interesting to understand that it's it's so systemic it's like all over the country and he's it's not only in the countryside, it's the cities as well, because the way they're being built way too fast and they can't hold the rainwater and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, and, and as, as Zach said, um, just driving through India, I guess, yeah, just where would, where would genders work was, it just felt like a lot more beautiful and alive in its nature. Because, yeah, because when the water comes back, there's all the animals return as well which is just beautiful excellent beautiful um let's see oh yeah question from eliza she was asking how do you see how we organ how do you see how we organize the revitalization of watershed communities that were being called to implement in a very limited time frame zach that's a question for you i think the there's a lot of different ways that um, you can approach this. And this is, you know, one of the big challenges that we're trying to address at Water Stories. Um, we've got a lot of different exciting ideas that we're going to be rolling out. But I think the big thing is just having community dialogue, getting real stakeholdership. Uh, I remember they took me to one project that the government had tried to do that was a total failure right next to all of their successful projects. And, you know, this was after 30, 40 years of them doing it. So the government just copied the same techniques, but they didn't connect with the community and actually get stakeholdership before they implemented it. So the community didn't ever use it. They didn't know what it was for or why it was there or any of these things. Um, and so I think you got to make space for those community dialogues to happen. And I think one of the things that they did in India that could be really successful for catalyzing this elsewhere is making 
water congresses or community water councils, where essentially the villages would all that made up different watersheds would all have discussion about what they have as far as shared resources, what they have as far as challenges. Um, and this speaks a little bit to a, another question that I saw as far as how the excavators were paid for. What Tarun Bharat Song does that I think that's very smart is they bring in one third of the project costs in the equipment expense and the community pays for two thirds of the project costs in the labor to implement the project and the tractors and the local equipment. So yes, they have some outside help to get over the hump, but really the community is mostly funding these projects and implementing these projects themselves with a little bit of guidance and leadership from outside. And that I think is the number one reason why these projects are so successful is it's not trying to go through government. It's not trying to go through private business or even aid organizations. It's just communities taking the power uh, into their own hands. And I think this also speaks to the previous question of how do we transfer this to Spain, Germany, Europe, the United States? I think it's with this same thing of communities getting together in dialogue, getting together in action, taking small steps, seeing the results. And then that creates this flywheel of success where you don't have to revive a river all at once. You just do one project and then the rainy season comes and everyone gets excited when it works and then they do another project. And before you know it, 10 years later, the river's flowing year round. Um, but you, you know, you can make it little steps of a lily pad hops instead of this big step that the big step is really needed, but it's a really hard place to start. Uh, and so, you know, for example, if you wanted to start one of these community water councils or congresses in your own area, starting with the film screening of this Water Bandits film would be an excellent way to start. Get your community together, share this story, and then talk about how that might apply to your local region. Do a couple of those events in a row, and before you know it, you have a real group of people uh, trying to work on this in your own region. Yeah. Remind anybody, it's like, please put your hand up. We would love to take some questions live. So, and the first person that puts their hand up is going to be able to talk. Hey, Marius Mueller. Okay, awesome. Zach, do you mind unmuting Marius? Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello, Marius. Hi. No, no video, no problem. Um, hello from Germany. Um, I just saw the the Water Cup some years ago. And I was amazed by this um, work from these people. And um, I thought, like, how can we multiply this um, this event to other countries? So it was so successful. I re really liked it. And, um, yeah, I'm searching for partners to do it. And, um, yeah, on the same side, how can we combine it with not uh, annual crop management? but with tree-based farming, like centropic agriculture. So we have, a, yeah, we can leave the soil where it is and don't have to plow it and stuff. So that would be um, great if I um, find partners to work on it. And um, yeah. And it's such an interesting question. It's like, you know, that's the water cup is this beautiful example of what can be accomplished in India in that context. So, you know, Andy Mills and I talked about it. It's like, why was that able to happen? And it's like, yeah, it's it's because it's it's India. There is so much community land that can be pulled together that even though it's frustrating, you look at Europe and, and the States and you're like, yeah, why can't we do that here? Zach, do you have any ideas or any examples of, of in other parts of the world where they did something like the Water Cup that wasn't just India? This is actually one of the things that, um, so as part of our, our core course, um, which for people that don't know, we have a course that trains people into how to do all of these types of things. And one of the uh, projects that have been started by our alumni is a task force for children's education. Um, and so what we're actually thinking about doing is basically making a curriculum module that could be distributed to schools that would be all about the water cycle and would also really put in some of the 
personal interaction and engagement that's essential with this type of work to lead towards a competition where basically different schools could implement some type of nature-based solution in their environment, whether it's storing water from the roof of the building or making a model ecosystem of their watershed and landscape or creating a small rain garden or gray water installation on the school itself. Uh, the idea is that basically we could try and get schools to have this competition amongst each other, uh, which would then also open up you know, kind of global collaboration between students. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways that we can engage something like this. It's, you know, not going to be the same. Uh, and I think with every place, one of the key things is water literacy of your local place to understand what solutions are applicable, what challenges you have. Uh, you know, these techniques work really well for arid environments, but you know, if you're in the UK, you're going to have a totally different set of challenges that similar techniques can be applied, but you need to have the understanding of climate and place to how to modify them. And where are the places that, you know, for example, tree crops are going to be one of the most advantageous things. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways to catalyze it. I think we're getting really excited about catalyzing it through schools and through youth, because it, in many ways, I think we need to activate the next generation to make better decisions that we ourselves made uh, so that as they move into positions of power and authority, they have a better understanding of what's possible from a water standpoint. Uh, because, you know, we just see that uh, far too few people know what's possible and we're getting stuck in despair and loss and so much fear about the future when you can see from this film how beautiful the future can be. And so I think we really need to help people understand and move in that direction. Yeah. I'm also thinking about um, in the watershed, uh, the water cup was uh, filmed by a media company, like the TV show, but how can we decentralize it? How can we make it like um, getting people on board who are on YouTube maybe and um, publish it on their um, community and yeah, start to be an opinion leader in this way um, and make a framework for them. So a YouTuber can say, hey, okay, I just need to copy this concept and bring it to my um, audience. And then the people have a, another concept. How can I implement the water shed management? And um, yeah, the first easy steps to um syntropic uh, agriculture maybe so yeah I, i love to connect with people on this topic and um work on it and um yeah cool city is another project where i'm doing something like the climate fresk um but for tree-based farming and the effects what it has on um yeah the environment and social aspects so enough talking time for me And um, thank you again for um, giving me this opportunity and wish you a nice evening. Uh, vielen Dank, Marius. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and please post about that in the community as well. It's a great place to find others to work on projects like this. Um, particularly in, a, in Germany, there's a whole team of students now working together uh, throughout uh, Germany and Austria. And uh, there's... Yeah, there's a, a lot of good people in there to connect with. So I think a lot of it is finding the people to collaborate with so that we don't have to hold these efforts ourselves. We can work together in community and share the load uh, to accomplish a sum greater than, uh, or ends greater than the sum of its uh, contributions. Mm, yeah, and I team water retention. Into the um, water stories website. Oh, great. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Marius. Yeah, I, it's it's really interesting. Did did Regenera ever really share with you guys the structure of how, you know, community land ownerships works works over there? You know, when you think of a thing like wa the water cup, you know, it was the perfect context for India. You know, here in the states, even here in Costa Rica and, and Europe, like there's so much private property ownership. 
that it's it's really interesting like how can something like the water cup which relies on large community land happen in a place where there's lots of private property um exactly did you ever did you ever, did you ever i think really there's actually huge potential for that and that i would argue that in ways it's actually easier on private property because you mm. don't need as much agreement before engaging in it um now there's other challenges but there is so much public land in you know various countries that needs addressing um you look at the the United States has millions and millions of acres of public land where all of this type of work could be done uh, if people understand about it and want it to be done uh, and try and make it happen. So I think, to be honest, it's not so much uh, a matter of who owns the land as much as the community agreeing that this practice is important. I think there are so many corporations that want to do this kind of thing. Now, they have their own incentive in doing that, but they have lots of land and lots of money and just need some communities that, you know, can lead the projects. Um, similarly, even things like, you know, the U.S. State Department wants to do this kind of work on Broadacre, on uh, hundreds of thousands of acres throughout the American West. So there's, I think there's the pieces of the puzzle that we need in all of these different areas, but how they get combined is a little bit different. And it all starts with getting the community to connect with one another around shared goals and shared mission, and then say, okay, what are the resources we have available to accomplish this? And you might find that someone owns a lot that they're not really using and someone else has some equipment and some another group want to volunteer the time and you have all of the ingredients. No one has the ingredients individually to make it happen. But when people work together, you do have all the ingredients. Um, so I think it looks different, but it, I, you know, I know and I see that it's not only possible, but there's interest in it everywhere. Uh, and it's really about aligning people uh, and doing it in a way that doesn't just immediately solve the problem, but is really in alignment with nature and natural cycles um, and indigenous knowledge. And then we can actually do it in a way that achieves something nice that we like long-term. And I think also, go ahead, yeah. please. I just wanted to add on that, that yeah, we can just start in a small scale, just putting more attention about what water actually is, because I think we've, most elements we've completely forgotten about the connection to water and if you dive in even deeper you know water we are 80 percent water the planet is 80 percent water and um and apparently water holds memory there have been all these different uh, experiments of like putting good thoughts and bad thoughts into water and then you could see how the crystals would change according to um of the emotions that would go into the water and i think that's just like one small example of what water actually is. The whole planet is just full of it. So actually, if we start connecting all to water, which I think should be the first thing to learn at school, then people will also start flushing their toilets differently. Or do we even need water in the toilets? Or like maybe looking at the tap water differently. So it's all interconnected. So I think, you know, the work really starts at home with oneself first and then, you know, with the people you're in contact with. So. Yeah, that's really, really important. It's a, a journey, not a destination. And I think it's more important about just taking small steps. It's really easy to see this and think, wow, we need to do this everywhere. But it's more about just every day taking some step in that direction. And that's the only way these communities got here over time. Uh, and I think the best way for us to build from that relationship as a starting point, because that's the critical piece. Well, does anybody else have a live question they want to ask? It's probably a great opportunity. It could be the last live question. And then we'll just do uh, text ones, then we might close it out. But we'd love to hear one last person live. Just raise your hand, and then we'll unmute you. Well, in the meantime, Lucy, I want to ask, you know, for what you shot in Rajasthan, all the water capture structures and the, and the beautiful results on land, 
what kind of water, um, what other areas have you seen in the world that could, that you think would really need the kind of water capture earthworks that you saw in Rajasthan? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, what's happening right now in, in Egypt and the Sinai Desert, which is, you know, huge lack of water. And, and they are now implementing the same structures as Rajendra, who's come there to actually teach and work with the Bedouin people on the land, because it's, again, working with the people from the land and giving them the wisdom and not kind of coming over like it maybe was in the past, like in, you know, uh, NGO or like a government structure or colonial structure. So it's really about um teaching the people the wisdom that's always been there so i think as i understood this type of uh, structures can really be implemented all over the world um and it was funny when i was in india last year a friend of mine who who was in australia and she was actually in contact with an aboriginal elder who had a dream that he shared with her which was about building these water structures and like rainwater harvesting and then and I was like, oh, my God, that sounds exactly like Rajendra's work. They need to be connected. So, um, so you know, and and with his commission of drought and floods, people's commission of drought and flood, of, was what, uh, where Zach is also part of, um, it's really about spreading this kind of methods all over the world. And and when I met Zach and I heard about his work in the US, I was like, wow, this is so fascinating. And that 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 in California, there's such a, a lack of water and that this type of of work can so benefit people all over the world and that's why I think it was so important to well that's why I really wanted to support Rajendra's work because he's so underrated and he is so key and I was with him at COP again now in uh, in Dubai and he's um you know you see all these people in suits and the fossil fuel companies and and you've got like these amazing people just really doing grass work grassroot work and activism on the land and they should be on stage so much more and I think um that's why you know as a filmmaker that's what one can do is just spread the message and um yeah so yeah, everywhere I would say this needs to be <laughs> and I think you know like the film's message is, is also not just the structures it's really about the questioning our education system um, looking at indigenous knowledge, like understanding that when you treat nature with respect and love, that you will get that back. And also uh, understanding the, the importance of decentralized um, community projects and, um, and how important trust is, because his team really goes into these communities and builds trust and they give them the knowledge and they work together hand in hand. And there's nothing about taking or extraction. It's all about trust and community building and and I think community building is one of the most important things we need to focus on right now and create these pockets of light all over the world yeah absolutely oh Zach real quick it looks like Michelle uh, yeah to talk do you mind if you unmute her hi Michelle hello hello Zach you probably Probably don't remember me, but we started Paradise Permaculture in Livingston together. No, I years do. Ago. Great to see you, Michelle, or hear you. And we, um, I have two questions, really. I'm assuming that when you get the curriculum for the schools together, that that'll be available from the community here. Okay. My next question is, is there anyone near me that can help me with a water project? Um, my husband and I were general contractors. We have equipment. We have tons of experience. I live at 7,300 feet. My well's gone dry three times. I did water, rainwater collection last year, but I have this huge coulee in front of my house. And right now, what is it, March, whatever, first week of March, it should be about 70 feet deep of snow. And there's maybe two feet. So I know that this area is going to be drought ridden very quickly and i'd just like to set up swales in that coulee with a pond or a series of ponds going down i just i don't know where to start i i need the big picture and then i can do it and i didn't take the core course because i'm 66 i'm supposed to be retired i'm still working construction and i don't want 
to do this. I like, I don't want to travel all over the world teaching people. We have a good core community. We have a seed saving event. We're gathering bodies around that are listening and paying attention and implementing. But I wanted to do one big class, one big water uh, project with as many of the community here as I could. But I don't know where to start. Yeah, that's a great question and a common question. Um, and, you know, something that we've really been working on solving at Water Stories to make it where there's hundreds, thousands, and eventually millions of people that can help others like yourself, Michelle, uh, move through these projects. Um, so I would certainly be open to it. Uh, we have other students in uh, the Montana area that might be open to it. We have other students in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, that I'm sure could help you as well. So if you, on the Water Stories page, there is a page for practitioners uh, that I'm going to share in here where you can uh, find the different practitioners. And this is for people all around the world as well. Um, and we've got a, a number of people to add here too. So keep checking back because uh, we've we've got new practitioners being ready to help others all the time. And then for people that want to understand how to do it themselves, our core course is really uh, designed to help solve that for others so that you understand it. And whether you want to just do it on your own landscape, you want to do it professionally, or you want to be an advocate, you can understand all of the pieces. Um, and I will say, too, that while we, I think, market or direct our our language more towards young people that want to make a career out of this, we do have a lot of people that go through the course that are in the retirement age and want to do something meaningful in their community. And this can also empower you to do that kind of work. Um, so Michelle, I know you're doing great things already and, and the course may not be what you need, but for others, um, we have a lot of people that, you know, they understand how amazing these kind of projects are with Regendra and they say, Hey, why isn't my community doing this? And I think in a lot of ways, it's the the people later in life that can help catalyze these changes by being points of knowledge in their community, by being space holders. Uh, and also a lot of times they have the resources of land. Like in this case, Michelle, you have a beautiful place to do an awesome demonstration project. That's something that you know a really young person right out of college is not going to have yet. And so how do we connect the people with the willpower to do this with each other uh, to enact change? And, and that's exactly what we're looking to do is, you know, connect the people with projects, with the people with the skills and the uh, youthful energy to implement them so that we can just make examples like this all around the world. Because when you go to an area like the Chambal district, you can't not understand it when you leave there and you can't not mm -hmm. find value in the work that they're doing. And if we can create these kind of examples all around the world, it's just going to expose so many more people to this so much more quickly. Um, you know, films, videos, all of that is great. And I think that opens the doorway, but when you can experience it with your own eyes, ears and feet, that's a whole different sensation. And so how do we make local examples for everybody uh, in communities around the world? Cool. By the Thanks, way, Sarah. anyone who wants oh, sorry. <laughs> anyone who wants to jump on a trip to India, Rajendra is holding a convention actually on the 20, 21st and 20th of March and taking people to Chambal and convening people like from all over the world to about around water and peace. So everyone's anyone's invited. So if anyone wants to go on a spontaneous trip to India, go for it. <laughs> and the details for that are in the link I just shared mm -hmm. um, in the chat here in the community. There's a, You can find it other places as well. Um, but yeah, I would highly recommend that if anyone has a, a wild hair to go and check it out. This is it's going to be a really amazing event um, and highly recommend experiencing it for yourself if you can. Okay, thank you, Zach. We got your room ready for you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Well, unless there's any other pressing questions, I think this could be a good time to gracefully end this lovely film premiere event.
Oh, we ju I... just have this little question. Is the chat uh, shared afterwards so we can ex get access to the emails and stuff? Uh, yeah, the chat, we usually don't, but... Um, Would be really great. Yeah, it's... Yeah, we can send it to you. Uh, we can email... Put... Yeah, email. I would say if there's specific uh, links you want, I would try and copy them now. We do share the links with the replay, um, but just for the sake of people's privacy, we don't usually share the emails just in case if they don't want them shared outside of the chat here on a on a more public post. Um, and I will say too, uh, definitely let's spread this. Uh, I just shared the link for this video on Vimeo. Share that. You know, if we all share that with 10 people, it's going to hopefully brighten up their day and help share this really important message with others. Uh, so let's, you know, let's get thousands or even millions of eyeballs on that film, ideally. And you guys can help with that process. All right. Well, we have one hand raised from Fedor. Zach, I'll leave that up to you if we do one last question. Well, and I think I know Lucy has a hard out in two minutes here. So, oh, Lucy, okay. do you want yeah, to share? I'm fine to stay on a bit longer, but okay. go on. Well, you can also continue because I think a lot of the, the technological questions are also for you. So, you guys can continue if you want. I just might need to leave in a few minutes, but Sounds go for good. it. Well, yeah, if you Don't do shut anything out. down because of me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, yeah. Uh, Fyodor, I apologize if I'm saying your name. Or yeah, wrong. yeah. Yeah. It's Fyodor. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I am myself involved in a citizen science project. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of drinkable rivers. Um, however, yeah, and we are involving citizens to have more connection, of course, with the river and hopefully also the municipality or other actors. The only thing is that it's sometimes difficult to bring students into connection with water. So yeah, my question is like how, how, what are maybe ways of engaging students in a way towards this more holistic way of water management and seeing water in general? Lucy, do you want to, do you want me to jump in first or? Yeah, go for it. Uh, this is actually, we're um, also working on a youth activation film uh, about this story. Um, so uh, this is, you know, really core to what we're hoping to do. I think there's a number of things that will also be shared in more detail in that film. Um, one piece is just water literacy, understanding where does your water come from? How does it get to you? Uh, what happens to the rain that falls in your area, whether it's just the premises of that school or the local watershed? Um, and then walking waterways is one of the best ways. It can be harder to do with a big school group. Um, and then with this curriculum pack that we're making, we're hoping that there's a good way to engage students within the classroom. Um, and then one activity that they do in India with youth is they replicate the water congress that they do, but they will then have the different groups of students act as different constituents on that waterway, human and non-human constituents. So one group of students will represent the fishes in the river. Another group of students will represent the trees. Another group of students will represent the ruling class. Another group of students will represent the common community, and they can have this dialogue around either specific projects that might take place or the general trajectory of the region. And I think the big thing is just getting students to understand what's happening around them in regards to water. And anytime you can make those connections, uh, you start to build that relationship and understanding. And I think it's much less so about getting specific techniques or ideas in their heads so much as providing the space for them to develop that relationship with and understanding of water. Oh, thank you. Uh, you gave a uh, very nice examples I could uh, implement. So, uh, yeah. And of course, yeah, it's the, the connection is the base fund, fu uh, fundament, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. And I'll say also just Drinkable River is a great organization. Um, we had them for one of our past webinars. Uh, maybe a couple of months ago now. So 
yeah, really great stuff you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully I, I want to uh, also grow in that organization. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like it's a good time to wrap it up and it's been a lovely event so far. Yeah, I think we maybe just have one last question from Elizabeth Harold. Okay. Oh yeah, I saw her raise her hand. Thank you for this. It's, uh, I think the, um, the, the media, the art music culture is a really, really important way of putting the message out into the world in a way that people can easily receive it in a fun way. And then what I also see is really important is networking, What I not preaching to the choir, but actually connecting the choir directors and finding those people that are already doing the work in your region and begin meeting with them together and really organizing those groups that are already active. And then from there, you can start strategizing as to what your watershed, the unique watersheds of, of your area require and start working on it together because I actually feel that it's our species evolutionary imperative to come into sort of a radical, hyper radical collaboration and really start learning how to work together. So we really have everything we need. And if we can start really working together on these challenges, then I believe we'll, especially if we align with water as the intelligence of the planet. So that's all, just one, really wanted to thank you and um, uh, open, to, open to anybody who's interested in, in that hyper radical collaboration. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Eliza. Yeah. Well, Fantastic. I think there's, there's also if thought that everything everything begins with water. So if we start, you know, the healing journey and connecting around water, then we're already doing so much for the planet. And, yeah. and um, we have the greatest ally ever because COVID showed yeah. us how quickly watersheds will regenerate if allowed to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much to learn. And I think I think that's why like the forums are, like this are so important because it really connects people and and it's about learning things that you might not be able to learn in conventional media or um yeah or in the education system so it's really important to create these pockets hmm. absolutely well and keep, I, and keep telling our water stories <laughs> exactly exactly everyone has a water story and we can write our own stories uh, and uh, yeah, this seems like a, a good spot to wrap up the session. Lucy, I want to thank you again so much for creating this film, first and foremost, for sharing it, for coming on this premiere. Um, it, it's a really wonderful film that we're going to make sure people keep sharing and getting more people to watch because it's such a hopeful message about the future that we could have if we all start working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, thank you so much for, for sharing the film and for everyone being so interested and active in this chat. And and something I just thought about, I wanted to add as well, that really blew my mind. I was saying earlier, like how, you know, Indigenous see the earth as a, a body. And, and for them, there are like seven main rivers, which are like the arteries of the planet, which is also the Ganga and the Congo and the Nile. And, and how important it is really to, to keep these rivers flowing. And that that is also, you know, will will rise the health of the earth and will also rise the health of us humans. So kind of like always going back to that kind of image, I think really also helps to to connect us back to the importance of keeping our water systems and water bodies clean and being connected to them, like going to them and and just, you know, giving thanks because they're really giving us everything. So, and according to indigenous, you know, water really, or well, the elements can feel it. So it's uh, something nice to try to just go and say thanks to the oceans and thanks to the rivers and thanks to, yeah, to the water that we drink every day. <laughs>